Hello guys. Hi guys, hi guys, hi guys. It is August 8th. It is that day that many of us have been waiting for. Not just you, but many, many, many. <laughs> not just you, not just me, but many of us have been waiting for this day. At least I have, and I know many of you have been waiting for this day. Let me adjust my my ring light. Hello, everybody. Today, we are going to learn from the one and only Mrs. Ibukun Awoshika, the woman that a lot of us look up to. At least I look up to her. I, I'm sure that many of you look up to her as well. So, yeah, I'm fixing my hair so that I can look presentable. <laughs> So I can look presentable for Mrs. Awoshika. Everybody, welcome. And I see that Mrs. Awoshika is already joining. She doesn't even need much of an introduction, honestly, because she's just that amazing woman who has answered her call and who is living in her purpose. And so, therefore, we all admire her because we all love what she does. Everybody, come in, come in, come in, come through. Send this live to any woman or man that you know may want to join us because we're going to be talking about how women can begin to use their voice to change the world so we're going to start now i'm going to bring mrs awoshika in and we're going to begin welcome everybody welcome yes 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 my big 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 sister mrs awoshika is here and i am just so <laughs> Good afternoon, Ma. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mrs. Awushika. Can How you hear you? me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, I can. Good okay. afternoon. Thank you so much. You, you can't You're even welcome. imagine how grateful I am that you took out, that you even said yes in the beginning, and then you took out this time to be with me today. I am so humbled. My pleasure. I, I'm oh, so hu I'm so humbled. May God bless you, you tremendously. Too. Many of us out here love you. I, I, do you know how much you're loved? <laughs> yeah. Thank God for that. Thank you. You're, you're loved this way. A lot of us love you. We admire you. And why do we admire you? Because you have answered your call. You are doing what God has put you on this earth to do. And we admire that because we all want to do the same. And this is why... I brought you on today, and many of us ladies who are on here, you, you, most of you know who Mrs. Awishika is, but if you don't, follow her. She is an entrepreneur, she's an executive coach, she's a corporate board professional, she's very, very passionate about helping us women that are coming behind her. She loves women, she loves girls, I'm sure she loves men's issues as well, but she has a soft spot for us women, I know that. So, Mrs. Awashika, how would you like me to address you, Mrs. or Pastor? Ibuko Awashika is simply my name. Okay, okay, okay. Then you know that in Nigeria, we're not allowed to do that for our senior sisters. So I, yeah. cannot, I cannot call you by your first name. Yeah. I believe I believe that you and my oldest oldest sister or my older brother were in the same kind of community or society. I don't know, but I feel like I was a young one then because I just, I turned fifty last year. So I believe that. Okay. I, yeah. So we're going to dive in, Mrs. Awoshika. The reason why I really wanted to bring you on is because I'm passionate about women too, and the first question I have for you is. There are many women who fill up my DMs, and I'm pretty sure they fill up your DMs, and you probably don't even have time to read them. I still read all of my DMs. But there are many women in life who are confused, who are lost. They are not sure which direction to go. Should I be focusing on my husband and my kids? Should I be focusing on my career? Should I start a business? What should I do? Where should I go? Can you start off with a word for those women, please? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Yabo. Uh, what I would say is I lay a foundation about the way I envision the life of a woman. Okay. Now, there are three balls, as I like to describe them. The first and the biggest mighty ball is the ball of you, the core of your life. 
And that consists, you know, when you were born, you were given your own identity, a name. You grew up with a vision and an ambition. You went to school, you did the work, you got the qualifications, you had things you wanted to do with your life. You built on that and you kept building on that. Somewhere along that journey, you met the guy and then you took on the other ball of being a wife when you chose one. And somewhere along the path of that relationship, you know, God bless your union with children or with a child. And you took on the ball of becoming a mother. Now, neither the ball of being a mother or the ball of being a wife existed without the core, which is you. And their additions to the core of who you are, they cannot and should not take away from the core of who you are. Because without the substance of your person, they do not exist. Now, what is important is that we mustn't get so caught up in all this um, cultural perspective over time that has eroded the core of the woman and has substantiated that and replaced it with just her ball as a wife or as a mother. And therefore, the women think in a way that, many women think in a way that they set aside their own person, their personality, their vision, their ambition, and then only begin to define themselves by their role as a wife and as a mother. Now, the unfortunate thing is, except the core works and works well, you cannot fully succeed in your role as a wife or as a mother because you cannot give what you do not have. And I have seen too many frustrated women who along the path of life had given up themselves in order to work in those roles and then realized at some point that their own dreams never went away. The ambition could never have been buried. It was there, pushed to the back. But every time they saw their friend, they went to school together doing something. They remember, oh, I used to be smarter than her. I could have done what she's done. Oh, I wish I'd done this. And then children grow up very quickly. By the time they're 10 or they're in teenage and they go off to college at 18, you're not as needed as you always thought you would be. Oh, they might need your money or the resources that you represent. <laughs> yes. But they don't need you the way you think. And then, you know, your husband, if he has a life, yes, you're together, you're one. But, you know, soon enough, conversation begins to die if you have no substance to your conversation. If he goes to work from morning till night and does something and you have nothing you're doing or you're unfulfilled, you can't even add value. So you, you are at your best when you are at your best in your role as a wife and a mother, when the best of you is at work. So what I would challenge each woman to do, don't ever lay down you. Maximize your own calling. Because if we're Christians and we understand that the callings of God are without repentance, if God does not waste resources and he has an assignment for which you were called, yes. you will still have to account for it when you get to heaven. And your husband and your children will not be acceptable excuses for it. So how do we make them all work? It's our responsibility to work out our salvation. We must work out how they work together. We must find, receive all the help we need in order to make them work. There's, there are no super women. I say this over and over again because I'm no superwoman and I haven't met one. I've just met women who are smart enough to receive all the help they need where they can find it, but to work out how the different parts of their lives will work together for them to achieve that which they desire. Wow. Ladies, I wrote down one statement, Mrs. Aoshika just said, receive all the help you need wherever you can find it. Why? Because you can't do it all. You can't do it all. I have to ask you a question, uh, please, Mrs. Aoshika, that I got a few weeks ago from a woman who was trying to sign up for my coaching. 
and she really wanted to, you know, to improve her life. She wanted a business. She'd been home with the kids for a long time. And she said her husband said no to her setting up a business. And he's the one who was going to finance the coaching and the business startup. And she was very disappointed. She feels frustrated. I didn't know what to say to her. I said, maybe you should just get quiet, find another time to talk to him and let him know that you are not satisfied with just being more, uh, with just being yeah, mom and wife. You also want to fulfill your purpose. But she says she doesn't know because he's not going to listen. There are many women like this. Again, we're not, this is not a man bashing video, guys. This is not because we have our own issues too. We do, okay? But this conversation is about women. How do, well, how do we help those women out of their predicament? Well, I think we need to go back. And part of us going back is I always say, look, if you draw a line in the sand, because we didn't have the right teachings and guidance, we've allowed a lot of women to make mistakes and find themselves in situations that it becomes difficult to navigate. Part of what we need to do is to invest time from the line we've drawn in the sand to teach the next generation of girls what is important about their lives. Absolutely. And that's so, for as many women as are single on the platform right now, or as many as have daughters and sisters and other girls that they would have to counsel, to counsel, it's absolutely important that you never give the remote control of your life to anyone. And I repeat that. It is absolutely important that you never hand over the remote control of your life to anyone. Because, to be honest, in a marriage, you have two adults. You don't have one adult, another child, and children. So technically, the wife should not need the permission of the husband in order to pursue her dream and her interest. Yes. She needs his support oh. and his encouragement, but she should never have to need his permission. Because before she met him and became his wife, she was a person and a personality with a dream and a vision. And that is why it's important for us and the church to teach these foundational things. Because the Lord said, your wife would be your helper. But the quality of the helper that a man gets is the quality of the wife that he facilitates the environment for her to fully emerge. Yes. And the woman herself must own her life because, guess what, guys? When we die, we're going to heaven. One man and his God, one woman and her God. Your judgment of your life is not based on who your husband is. It's based on the fulfillment of your own assignment and that which the Lord has called you to. So you are the one that is responsible for working out your salvation in order to ensure that you can live the life that God has called you to. Now, Let's go back to the actual question. I wanted to lay the foundation so that let's draw a line. We have those problems already. Let's start rebuilding the future better by helping the girls to think differently. And then we go back to those who are already in it. And every woman knows her own husband. And you must work out how you get that man to support that which you need to do. Now, the real catch in the question you asked is because the guy is the one that controls the money. Yes. Okay. So, you need to ask yourself as a woman, why do you want to be a woman that is kept? Because that's part of a control mechanism. And you need to ensure that you are an empowered woman in many ways so that you are able to take decisions that are 
in the interest of your life. Yes. So what does she need to do? What she wants to do, she needs money from him. Can she work out how that can be done without the money from him? She does need his support as long as she's married to him. So she needs to continue to engage. And sometimes when you think someone isn't listening, take the time to sit down and pour your heart out on paper. Write exactly how you feel about being in a box and at a standstill and wanting to move on with your life in order to create value for your family. Because ultimately, whatever value she's able to create from fulfilling herself is also value she's creating for the family. Yes. So you need to start that conversation. Two, sometimes you need to find influencers in your husband's life. Find those who are influencers in his life and share your thoughts and your vision with them. And find those that you can get on your side of his influencers. Okay? And then ask for the help and the support of the influencers for that conversation to become an open conversation so you can make your valid point. And in making those points, make sure you show him the value he will get from your becoming what God has called you to. And start trying to execute what you want to do without money. Find the non-financial model. Yes. That so you can have a proof of concept to show the value that you will create. And then pray about it as well. And do not leave God or the man until you get what you want. Fully loaded answer. Thank you very much, Mrs. Aoshika. I talk to women a lot about one, a couple of what you said about you don't need money to get yourself out there. And that's the, that's the nucleus of what we're discussing today. Every woman, social media is here now. You know, if you and I can be using social media to leverage our, our mission, what are the 20 year olds and the 30, 30 something year olds doing? But if you tell them to come out and speak their truth, they'll say they're worried about their accent. They're worried about the way they look. I've heard it all. Oh, my accent, my this, I don't want to. They're so conscious of everything. Women, you can come on Instagram and start building your brand with no money. Yeah. No money at all. You can start off, but you have to execute. You have to implement. If you stay home and complain, if your husband sees that you're doing something proactively, yeah. he will understand the value of what you're doing. He will understand it. So the non-financial model of getting yourself out there, Mrs. Aoshika just said it, get up and do something on social media. It's gone at the days where you have to rent a shop for something, something thousand dollars or something a million naira. Your Instagram page is your shop. You build your brand. You follow people like myself and Mrs. Awoshika. You copy, not that, not copy everything, but copy it and make it your own and start yeah. speaking your truth. So I hope that this person got it. I got a question which is similar. Uh, the lady said, is it okay to go into marriage without having a business or a, proper, or, or a properly defined job first? To be honest... My personal answer, which I give to every girl. First, don't get into marriage until you have a sense of yourself. Yes. Until you have a self-identity that you take in. The, the question we just discussed is a product of a woman who had no personal financial standing or personal identity, which the guy cannot question. If you're already a woman in a career or in a job or doing a business and a guy comes to meet you, he knows what he's getting. He's not, you know, once you get people started on something, it's difficult to withdraw rights you have given to people. So if you accept, if you know that the man fully understands your ambition and your vision, even though it hasn't materialized right now, and you know that he has the capacity to support and to encourage you, even in that uh, career and vision. And don't stay too long sitting, waiting, you know, first let the man get used to you being at the door when he arrives. 
get used to hot amala and hot spanded jam and everything waiting when it comes back. And then all of a sudden you decide that you want to go and work and is wondering, oh, I'm now not going to get, you know, those things. You are used to running errands for him all day and all of that. It's one of the most difficult things is to take from people rights you have already given them. So you need to, I prefer that girls have a defined life in some ways, have a sense of themselves, have started on a path of where they want to go, are far more self-confident and assured, have some level of personal stability before they move into marriage. It makes a lot of difference. There's it mutual does. respect. It does. There's mutual respect between both parties. And it that does. would play out throughout. So yes. that would be my answer. Yes. And I believe that 100%. However, I have a question, even from my own personal life. How yeah. do we, because this is my second marriage. I remarried last year. I was, with, I was married for 15 years prior to that. And with my ex for 23 years, we met in medical school. I was 17. He was 21. And we dated for eight years before we got married. Mm. How, and I have two daughters now. One is 17, one is 24. Mm. How do, and, and they get it. They understand. They watch me. They are learning life skills. But at that young age, how do women, like you said, we need to start teaching women what to do. But at that age, how do you know what you want and what you don't want? Obviously, the way I chose my husband then was very different to the way I chose my husband this time. But I was naive. I met him in school and we dated for eight years. So at 17, my brain wasn't even fully developed. How do we help the young age? I guess you had answered that earlier, but if you can just say, because I know there are many women in this situation in college, they fall in love mm -hmm. and it's all love and love and love. And they just keep going without really even knowing who they are yet. Okay. Well, I think one of the biggest things we will do is we will continue to teach, you know, which is part of why I run my life series project. It was principally to try and ensure that the overall mindset of the young woman is different. Her considerations for making... See, dating a guy is different from marrying him. <laughs> Very. <laughs> they're, they're, they're two different things. So it's okay if you're dating from 17, 18, 19, 21. You're exploring. Hmm. You're discovering yourself. You're discovering what you like in a guy and what you don't. Because... Oh, the guy looks like he's the sun, the moon, and the stars mm -hmm. when you start. Two years down the line, three years down the line in dating, you realize that, gosh, this guy is not really what I want for my life. Because, you know, and the, the other thing is we've so cooked up people's head in terms of marriage that they just want to wear a white dress, you know, and be a princess for a day. Mm -hmm. And I always say to girls, don't marry a guy because he wants to marry you. Marry him because you want to marry him. And yes. Two different things. If the guy who wants to marry you for the reasons that are the right reasons is also the guy that you want to marry for the right reasons, then you're fine. But you must have a sense of yourself so that you can tell that this guy is the right fit for the core of who I am and yes. for the future that I desire. Now, will you know the fullness of your future? Absolutely not. Yeah. But that's why I always use the word, have a sense of who you are. Just, you know, I always knew I wanted to be the best of myself. As a young person, as a teenager, I, I used to express it like, I, I want to be the president of Nigeria so I could change things. But really, it was really simply that I wanted to change lives and I wanted the world to be a better place. Yes. And as I grew into career and life, I realized that I could do all of those things without a political career. And mm. that's what I seek to do with all that I do with my life. You know, invest time in helping other people to build their own lives. Invest time in helping to build companies and to build co corporates. Not be quiet about issues that you know i consider important to speak up on you know and all of that and then you realize that all of those things 
along that path, you get better at understanding who you are. And you get to a point where you can tell, this guy is handsome, he has a great career, he, he looks like he's set up to make money, but he's not the right guy for me. Why? Because based on where I want to go, this guy, his career path will keep him away from home. I want to have a home. I want to have a husband and children that were together. I don't want to live in one city and my husband is in another. So I cannot marry a soldier because a military guy is on the move. And that gives me one condition to say, no, it doesn't matter how handsome or how much of a general the military guy who is chasing you is. I take him out of, the, out of play because based on the way I see it, he doesn't fit in with the future that I want for myself. And um, you're dating a guy, you already know that he's cheating on you, he's doing stuff. I don't want to marry a guy that I will always feel like second best or I'll always have a sense of insecurity about his love. So even if he turns around and say, okay, I want to marry you now. No, I don't want to be the girl that won the competition amongst yes. many women. You yes. know, as a convenient girl for him. No, no, no. I want to marry the guy that I can go to sleep with a sense of self-assurance of his love. Does it mean our life will be perfect 360 days of the year? No. We would have our own relational issues along the path. But I will never doubt. I've been married for 30 years. This is my 31st year in marriage. Mm -hmm. But I can go to sleep and know without a doubt that I married my own husband. And we've worked because we have that sense of trust and commitment to one another, despite whatever other things you have to deal with in between. And we're more than ready at any point in time to stand together to support one another. You have, it's a choice that you make. Don't ever forget you have the power to make that choice. Yeah. And you know what? I'd rather you get married at 40 and be married for 30 years and be happy than be married at 25 and be divorced at 30. So just work out what exactly is your vision for marriage and what is the basis for which you want to be married. Is it so everybody else can call you Mrs.? I don't use any title. My name is Bukwaroshika. So it's not the title. I'm glad to be married because I'm married to a great guy. I would hate to be married if I'm married to a guy that makes my life miserable. Yesterday I was in a conversation about a guy married to a beautiful young woman, four children, but beats her like she's about to die any day. That's no marriage. That's no husband. That's an enemy, not a friend. And there's absolutely no value in that relationship. If at the end of the day, the girl prays that if she stays there, she doesn't get killed or that even the children do not get traumatized by the experiences they see every day and that she doesn't lose her job because she cannot have the peace of mind that allows her to prosper at work. I would rather you're single, have peace of mind, and you wait for the man who has the capacity to be the man who can enhance who you are and help your core to be the best of itself while you help him and his own core to be the best of himself. And if you have children, that you have the opportunity to raise for the world a generation of people that would add value to the world. So it's, I mean, marriage is a beautiful thing, but only in the context that it works. And we just have to allow women to understand that they do have a choice. They, they have a choice. They have a right, a God-given right to wait to find the right guy and to say no when it is no. And not to respond to other people's opinion or their pressure. People want you to get married. Are they the ones that will get married? Are they going to be in the home with you? Are they going to face the challenges you face if you marry the wrong guy? Are you living your life for anybody else but for you? There's only one person that will care about you above all else. That's you. And you better learn to fight for yourself. Thank you. Huh. <sighs> I wish all women thought like you. There's many, many questions coming up and I'm going to summarize all of them that there are many questions coming here. I was going to ask you the same about 
What about if the woman is already married and she's being cheated on chronically? There are many women that come to my DM and I tell them, if my husband is cheating on me, we will go to counseling, we'll try counseling, we'll try prayer. But if it doesn't work out after a short period of time, I am leaving. I would leave. Are you asking for my advice? That is what I would do because I cannot tolerate cheating. This is what I tell them. But some of them will say, oh, but I still love him. But what about the children? So that's one dimension, Mrs. Awushika. And then there's the other dimension where there's a lot of older women in their 60s, 70s, 80s, mommies, aunties, and all that, who will be begging these women to stay? Who will say, ah, all men do it, all men cheat. Where are you going? Sit down and stay there with your husband. Where are you? That is a big problem in our society. It's a big problem, and I'm not part of it at all. There's, there's many women who, oh, just sit down, just manage him. Ah, you can't, can you, oh, they, they all do it. Every man does it. So, you, you know, this is what's confusing women. And there's also, and I, and I know I'm talking about a lot, but it's all fundamentally the same. There are a couple of women here who've asked, is it okay to remarry after a failed marriage? I get that in my DM too, that, oh, Dr. Yabo, how come you didn't feel guilty? But the Bible says that we shouldn't remarry after a failed marriage. And I'm like, which Bible are you guys reading? <laughs> which Bible... Which Bible are you guys reading? My own heavenly father wants me to be happy. What I've read in the Bible is that God wants me to be happy and I'm not going to sit down in a miserable marriage for the rest of my... So women do have that belief that they are not... If they get divorced, the Bible says they should never remarry. There's those older women who say, just sit down with your husband. That's your husband. Sit down, whether he's cheating on you or not. Sit down there. Where are you going? But the Bible says, if the unbelieving husband wants to go, you should let him go. So uh, how are you supposed to be tied to a situation uh, uh, forever? Obviously, divorce is not something any of us would like. No. And that's not what you should seek. And no. that's not what you should walk towards. In At every all. situation, you must apply, you know, yourself in the best way to build a stable home you know, in your relationship. The reality, you know what Yabo is, every woman for herself. And when I say that is you're just going to have to be responsible about making the right decision for you. You know, the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. But one thing people need to know is counsel is information. It is not instruction. Mm -hmm. Counsel is information. It is not instruction. Every person that you will seek, and you must also sort of predetermine the kind of people that you take counsel from and the basis of their qualification to give you the counsel. Yes. That's one. Yeah. Two, no matter who is giving you the counsel, the counsel that you get is information that allows you to have a 360 degree view of your situation. But only one person has the right and the power to make a decision, and that's you. Yes. Why is that important? When you have all the information and you have the 360 degree view of the situation, you can match all that information with who you are, where you're going, what you've been called to, what is your sense of your own commitment and your assignment and your overall situation? And you owe it to yourself, including having prayed and being led by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For some, it might be the right thing to leave. For some, for whatever reason, it might be the right thing to stay. Remember the guy in the Bible that the Lord told to go and marry a prostitute. Yeah, mm -hmm. but there was a purpose in it that God wanted to achieve, you know, and it is your understanding of what your assignment is, what um, the grace you have been given and the circumstance that you find yourself in and all the information you have from counsel matched with what is at 
what aligns with your spirit man and then you make the right decision for you why is it important because you are the one that is going to have to live in the decision live with the decision that you make yes and you must know why you will fight to defend it as long as you're not stupid enough to stay until you get killed in a situation no no so it's it's such a personal situation that you cannot give a general answer because when you want to take a counsel on a matter that concerns a woman about should I go, should I stay? Yes, Osiah is the one that the Lord told to go and marry a prostitute. You must be able to have all the different components of the actual circumstance. So no two cases are the same. You have to have all the facts together. But the only person who would ever have the full facts is the person who is in it. Yes. So make your own decision based on what you know. If you know that you're dying slowly in a relationship because it's abusive, it's toxic, it's destroying your personality, your mind, and your ability to serve the purpose of God, separate yourself from it based on the circumstance that you know. And sometimes a separation is not even divorce. You just get yourself out of it. You know, and you give yourself time to see if there's a chance to rebuild and to heal. And there's a possibility of a change. If, if you do that and things work out and you're convinced in your heart that things can go back and be better, fine. But if not, you know, you have to be alive to take care of your children. Yes. It's better that <laughs> children grow up with a single parent in a healthier environment without their own mind and their self-confidence and their personality destroyed than that they stay in a toxic environment that turns to... I mean, if you go to prison, and this is a fact, the highest number of women in prison for murder are women who killed their husbands. True. Yes. Fact. Yes. How do you think they get there? Don't go stay manage yes continue and they <laughs> continue to bottle up pressures and yes. challenges that one day they mm. snap yes a life that could have been saved is further destroyed and she then becomes a prisoner the children lose a father and they lose a mother because we have a cultural perspective that does not allow women to have a sense of identity and a, a, a sense of self-protection of purpose. Every man and his God. Every woman and her God. When we get to heaven, you're not walking in as Mrs. Somebody. You're walking <laughs> in as you. And you're going to have to present the case of performance and assignment. Yes. And, and that's, for me, that's the reality. So yes. the way we protect the situation is to spend more time teaching the girls now. Yes. So that they can avoid the mistake of marrying the wrong guy. Yes. And we also spend time teaching our guys to be the best husbands for the women that we're teaching. <laughs> Who is doing that, Mrs. Aoshika? Who it's are part the of what teaching I do. the like men? My live series program, I have male-only sessions Okay. some male guests. Okay. And I have women-only sessions, and I have sessions that are combined. Good. But if we don't spend time to build the men as well, we're getting to a point where the men are despising the women yes. for the attention that they're getting. And even if they don't despise them, when you spend a lot of time to prepare the girl to marry a guy that is unprepared, you have not done her any service. Absolutely, absolutely. So now we're going to move towards the path. And I hope that I'm still respecting your time. It's fine. Take okay. the time you want. It's fine. We are now going to go through the path of what we really came to talk to about today. Because, but we spent this much time on our personal lives, on our marriage lives, on our relationship lives. Why? Because that's the biggest issue for us women. 
<laughs> 90% of the time in my DM, the issues you guys have that is preventing you from speaking up, preventing you from your purpose, preventing you from your dream, and fulfilling your assignment on this earth is because of some toxic or some confused relationship you're in. So now we're going to move towards there. So now, Mrs. Awoshika, how do women figure out their gifts and talents. You'll talk to some 40-something-year-old women, they'll say they don't have any gifts or talents. You talk to some 32-year-old women, they'll say that they don't, have, they don't know what their gifts and talents are, they, they don't know what their purpose is. How do women start to identify what their gifts and talents are so they can use those to live out their purpose? Okay, I think the first thing to say is that we overthink this matter of purpose. Yes. You know, we've made it so technical and complex that people are looking for this eureka moment yes. of identifying yeah, what their purpose is. True. You know, whatever your hand finds to do, do it well. Wherever you find yourself relevant and able to add value, add it. And keep going with it. You know, first and foremost, I'm a firm believer in the fact that we do not have one single purpose in life. Yeah. That we serve different purposes for different seasons of life. And that God uses our assignment in different seasons to prepare us for assignment in other seasons. So, what are you doing now? Are you bringing a smile to somebody's face? Are you creating some value? Are you changing a life? Are you doing something that is worthwhile? Whatever it is for that time and that season, do it. But be open to other opportunities or ways that come or, or doors that open to you. And, you know, the Bible says you will hear a voice telling you which way to go, whether to turn to the left or to turn to the right, that you may walk in it. If you are a child of God, in the course of your life and your move, your job, sometimes you go to a place to work, it's after the fact that you realize why you were in that place. If you are the reason somebody did not commit suicide there, you serve their purpose. If you are the reason that a woman's marriage is saved because of your relationship with that person there, then you serve their purpose. If you are the reason that someone who is depressed and never had anybody to love them and to encourage them, finds you as someone that they can relate to and that they can talk to readily, that you can lift their spirit and hold their hand, you have served their purpose there. You know, what is the purpose of God? Humanity. The yeah. salvation, the ultimate purpose for all of us is that our lives will be relevant in saving the souls of men for God. And if what we do every day will bring value to help lives to be saved into the kingdom. And, you know, when we, we don't save all lives into the kingdom by preaching Jesus. Yeah. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. If we show love to an unloved person, we've helped a life, and we, at that moment, we have shown them what it is to love like Jesus. Because Jesus loved an unlovable church, and a people, and a world that was full of sin. Yet, he died for that world. So, it, it's really... We, we've made people feel a sense of worthlessness and feel unimportant and irrelevant because we have overpreached this purpose I in a way that you know, people just think, oh gosh, I have no purpose. I have no, there's nothing I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's not something big and grand, how, how, all our callings are different. Yes. You know, and our assignments are different. And yet, we can quietly live our life and have the greatest impact. Yes. I believe that my housekeeper at home, who has served me for about eight years, mm -hmm. has been the greatest, a great blessing in my life because 
because of who she is and the work she does, I am able to do the work that I'm called to do. Yes, yes, so yes, yes. Her service is part of the purpose that has allowed me to fulfill a purpose. I love that. I love if that. If my driver has worked with me for so many years, makes it possible for me to go back and forth and keeps me safe. Yes. And have a safe space when I'm in my car where I can have a conversation on anything without thinking yeah. about it. That person has been a blessing in my life. And who knows how I have been able to influence their lives too in every other way. It's really love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible says, oh, no man, nothing but love. Frankly, our biggest purpose on the face of the earth is to share the love of Christ. Yes. And to share it in such a way that we make many comfortable to come to Christ. And we're assigned to different platforms. If you're a doctor, like you are in the hospital, you're not necessarily preaching Jesus, mm -hmm. but you're treating patients with the love and care and attention to detail that makes them know that you're different. Yes. And you're encouraging them when they are down, but with the heart of Christ in a way that they're able to open up to you much more than they will to just their normal doctor. And then you're able to encourage them. Yes. Do you know how many lives you'd have saved? If you're a teacher who pays the extra attention to that child that's always quiet in class, and you're able to find out that he doesn't get to eat at home because his mother can't afford it, and you're sure that he eats well at school and you check on him because he's smart, but he needs the support and the encouragement because he has an abused father who only has the wrong word for him. And you are able to always make sure that you tell that child, you know what, Sarah, you're beautiful, you're smart, mm -hmm. and I know you're going places. And you tell that child the word that he can never get at home. And that child looks forward to seeing you because you are the sunshine in her life and you help to counter the pain the child is going on at home. You're serving a purpose of saving a life for God. We're overplaying this purpose thing and we're making people feel like except they're getting uh, a Nobel Prize, they haven't done something. <laughs> we're all called differently. We will all, the, the important thing is like a jigsaw puzzle, every piece of the puzzle is key to making the entire picture. Yes. All you owe God is to fulfill your part of the puzzle. Yes. And that's in your everyday living. It's not in the big ah uh, moments. It's in our everyday living. Yes. And we must learn to be comfortable and to enjoy those moments. Yes. If there's a big ah uh, moment in our future, we will get there. As we're pursuing God on our everyday basis, we will get to the big moments. Yes, absolutely. And we can't even get to those big moments unless we're responsible with the little moments. Yep. So this is what I tell women that you want those big things. You want to be like Dr. Yabo, but do you know all the little things that I did here? Do you know how all the hard work and how I, I was very shy with public speaking before? A lot of my mm. close friends, when they see me now, they're like, Yabo, this is you and my family. They're like, what got into Yabo? <laughs> but when I started seeing the, pop, the meaning, the purpose of why God put me on this earth, I'm like, ah, I'd better get up and go and do this. Three years mm. ago, a woman uh, messaged me on LinkedIn. It was, she was a nurse. She said that I was just reading your blog and I was going through a few of your videos on YouTube. I wasn't even that present on you. She saw a few of my videos from the United Nations and she said, I've been so depressed, depressed. I've been considering suicide. But when I read your blog and listened to a few of your videos, it gave me hope that somebody in the medical field could be doing these things and not bogged down by their work. That was the day I said, ha, ah, so... I really need to put myself out there. There are actually people whose lives will be saved because of That's me. it. I'm doing this today because it's about lives. I, I, I make the sacrifice of time. I just got into, I'm in New York right now. 
I just got into New York last night, very late last night, totally tired and exhausted. I'd been in Chicago for the last three days, speaking at the Global Leadership Summit. Spent the whole of yesterday teaching at Witten College. And God bless you. Program. Thank you. Hmm. But lives, that's what God counts. Yes. The salvation of souls. And when we had agreed, I agreed to today because I knew I would at least have gotten in by last night. And this gives me pleasure every time. I, and, you, and you know what? When you're working the call and the purpose of God for your life, you're also doing yourself a great favor. You are also, you're sowing seeds that will bless you in moments that you least expect. I mean, the last few months have been, you know, a very interesting season for me. But I have been so blessed by so many voices, by so many people, oh. by the same people that I just meant to bless with my life and my work, who then all got up to be a blessing to me to encourage, to lift up, to fight, to, you know, and I realized, you know what? Every good we do, we do for ourselves as well. Yes. Yes. The seed and the harvest. Oh. I'm telling Mrs. Aoshika, I don't have a bad day anymore. I don't. I actually don't. I just, you know, it's fine because I know that my, the meaning of my life is much bigger than yeah. what I think. I always tell mm. women, you're worrying about this, worrying about that. It's because you don't, you don't have work to do. It's because there no, there's nobody <laughs> out there that is waiting for you. If you're yeah. moaning and groaning about your little problems here and there, if you know that there are people out there who are waiting for you and waiting for your voice, you'll never have a bad day again. Not that you won't be tired or whatever, mm. but you will, the little things won't matter anymore. No, it's even to think about Look, what you call your problems, compare it to the problem of others. I know. And then the Bible says, for our light afflictions are but for a moment. Yes. They work it for us an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That our trials build character in us. God designed us to have those moments that remind us who is God. Because, you know, success is a dangerous thing. It is. <laughs> yes. And if your life, is. if everything is going and going, <laughs> if you're not careful and you're not tied to the elm of God, you'll get you big-headed. You can forget yourself. Yes. And forget who is in charge. And God uses moments to retool, to prepare, to equip, and to ensure that whatever we need to pick up for the next assignment, that we get prepared for it. Remember Paul? For the greatness of Paul as an apostle, he had a problem that he never could solve. He had a pain that he bore. And he went to the Lord how many times? And the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Not because God could not deliver him of the problem. But God chose to give him a cross to bear and to hold on to because of the greatness of the work he had assigned to him and to ensure that he will never, ever forget that there's a God who is in charge. And he bore that cross till the point of death. But did that stop him from achieving greatness? No. So our lives are in seasons. Things will come, things will happen, but it doesn't stop us from being able to influence one life today, one life tomorrow. Do it afraid and do it with pain. Sometimes you are in pain and then you see someone in greater pain. Mm -hmm. and you forget your pain <laughs> and you step out. To oh. Because the ministry that you have in you to help that other person at the sight of that person's pain will make you forget. Yes. And you will oh. get into that mode. But you know what? It's also possible that if you do not give yourself the right mindset to know that, look, my life is to serve God. You can, because you have the power to do it, you can allow yourself to wallow in self-pity mm -hmm. and get buried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you will lose track 
and the season will pass and you will miss the assignment. Yes. The sad thing is for everything the Lord has called you to, he has 7,000 other people waiting that can do it. Yes. So don't, don't ever get big headed that you think, oh, you know what? God is going to wait for me forever. Oh, God. The callings of God are without repentance, but the purpose of God will be fulfilled. If you don't step up to it, somebody else will. Somebody else will. And the work will continue. Hmm. But you miss that moment and that opportunity, which is why you must always remember what your assignment is. You cannot, you know, allow yourself to wallow. You cannot sit back and say, oh gosh, oh no. You can't, it's not a pity party. There's work to be done. When people die and I go and visit with them, what I always remember is that that person has just clocked out. Yeah. I'm still on the, I'm still on the clock. Yeah. <laughs> and every minute on that clock, I still have to account for. It just reminds me that time is going. And so instead of getting buried in it, I will sympathize, empathize, you know, mourn with them, but I keep moving because I am still on the clock and everybody's time is different. Hmm. Mrs. Aoshika, we're going to end here, but I want you to end with giving us a way that women can now go and ponder, start to think about how they are going to execute start to think about how they're going to implement, start to think about how they're going to start fulfilling the assignment and how they can start to use their voice to change the world. What should they all depart with today? Look, you owe it to yourself to live your best life. God gave you a voice for a reason. Everybody's voice is not at the United Nations nor in the White House, or in Aso Villa, <laughs> or even in a boardroom. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. But every woman has a voice mm -hmm. that can change the world. Yes. And the world is not 190-something nations. It might just be the world around you in the 100 square meters around you. Yes. Whatever your hand finds to do, Go to bed every night knowing that you've done the best you can in the circumstances that were presented to you that day. And if that day was your last day on earth and you had to meet the Lord, will you be able to say, Lord, I did the best hmm. that I can. That's all. It's not about the big drama. Mm -hmm. you do the best you can with every situation that is presented to you on each day. It's one day at a time one that adds to the time. years of your life. Hmm. And when you do that, you would find that 10 years down the line, you will look back and you can't believe you've done the things that you have. And you know, give the Lord the best of you and let him turn it into the best of his own purpose. Huh. I need to write that down. <laughs> Because that's all you need to do. I love that statement. Give the Lord the best of you. Best of you. And, and let him turn it into the best of his own purpose. And let him, I need to share this with my daughters. And let him sh turn it into the best of his own purpose. The best of his own purpose. Because that's why the Lord said, let the weak say I am strong. Your weakness doesn't disappear. But the strength of the Lord fills your weakness and gives you strength. He says, let the poor say that I'm rich. Your poverty doesn't go away, mm -hmm. but the wealth of God becomes available in that situation and meets your need. So, you know, the liberty I have to dream and to continue to be ambitious at any scale is because it has nothing to do with me. The whole of heaven is open to me for the things I seek. And all I am supposed to do is to dream it, to seek it. The Bible says, ask until your joy is full. He said, you have not received because you have not asked. Ask. Seek 
until you find. Right. Knock and the door will be open unto you. So all I'm supposed to do is ask. The one who gives is God. All I'm supposed to do is knock. The one that opens is God. All I'm supposed to do is seek. The one that will cause me to find is God. I do my part and let him do his part. And if I ask and it doesn't happen, he knows why. I don't need to worry my head with something that wasn't my problem from the onset. So it sets me free. He whom the son has set free is free indeed. Just go and live your life free. Enjoy it. Take on the chances and let God manifest himself. And if some things don't work out, so what? Big deal. Continue. <laughs> and enjoy the ones that do. And let the Lord be glorified in every minute of your life. Amen. It's been my pleasure to be here. We love you so much. You. We love you. We love you. May God bless you. May God bless your family. Amen. Dawashika, thank you very, very much. Everybody has been thanking you all through this live. We Thank all you. love we all love you very very much. Thank you guys Thank for you. joining. Thank you, Mrs. Awoshika. Please have a restful day. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I plan to. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye bye, right. guys. Bye. bye bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.